something that enables people to make it a bit more of a meditative practice and we kind of take a moment to come inside and be like okay what am i feeling so it's not all about expressing so then it's not all performative um and to try and get people to see that it's not about how you're being heard but it's about what you're expressing hello welcome back to the podcast appreciate you being here today we've got kate lister on the show before we get into who she is and why I wanted to get her on, please hit that subscribe button. I'd appreciate that very much. It helps support and grow the channel without doing anything but clicking a button. So I would appreciate that a lot. Now, Kate Lister, I was curious to get to know this person a little bit more when I witnessed her hold space and tell some stories and guide a workshop at a Move, Breathe, Chill event in London around 2018, and then recently on the 100 Human Experience event. So Kate teaches a voice activation workshop and gets people listening to themselves just that little bit more, listening to the air in their lungs, getting more in tune with that space and that distance of what can activate through our voice and through sound and really try and get into the root of where that's coming from. It's a very powerful workshop and feel it does a lot for us in the modern day that it's sometimes hard to get away from the stories that we bring and attach and connotations that words have in certain situations. Uh, how we can kind of get past all of that just to be more present. And I think there's a lot we can learn from Kate. So wanted to get her on to dive a bit deeper, have a present conversation and just learn more about who she is and what she's bringing to the world. So I hope you enjoy. Again, please subscribe if you can take a nanosecond to do so. Other than that, enjoy the podcast. Speak soon. And the way you live your life, seemingly, from my perspective, would be that you really try your hardest, which is hard at times, especially like a yoga te- um, as a yoga teacher, it's hard to keep it not so serious and, and try and really do your best to be human. And uh, especially with your business online and things like that, when, when you kind of like have that as a space which you interact with personally and professionally, these lines get kind of blurred and it's very hard to ground um, and just just be human within it all. Oh, that is so true, isn't it? That's something I I think I've thought, I don't want to say come up against because it's not like a huge barrier, but something I've thought about a lot because there are so many areas of the industry that get really serious. And I think, yeah, <laughs> the risk of taking things too seriously is that you set yourself in stone right and people make these like really serious sort of um claims that are like this is the way to do things and this is this and this is this and this is the answer and i think like when you i don't know when maybe maybe it takes a few years in the industry or maybe it's just a certain outlook i think nothing's ever solid like that so inevitably you come back around like a year later and be like oops <laughs> you know like it's it just mm-hmm. it, it, things change all the time and especially with like wellness and psychological stuff and all the stuff that we're into and, and that whole industry of wellness and how like it's a massive industry now which is nuts um but beautiful in many ways um but things change all the time and I think also as humans we change all the time so to not put ourselves in boxes by making really st- serious heavy statements of like this is who I am this is what I do and I think remembering that I have to keep that kind of flexibility I don't know if I have to but I want to and it, it serves everyone better I think to keep that flexibility about who we are and what we're doing here on the planet and let alone in the wellness industry I think that means I take myself a lot less seriously than I could um, 
but also I just like having a nice time. <laughs> I really just want everyone else to have a nice time. So I think you know, there's there's a level of seriousness that can be left left alone. You know. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think for me, because it's been a theme, I guess, of the last few years of like catching myself getting too serious on on a topic or or whether I'm just focusing so close to something that I forget to like just see, oh, okay, this is just one way of viewing it. Or this is just me in this moment, just like doing my best and taking it seriously. Cause I, cause I want to, not because anyone else should. And then I feel like, oh, what am I trying? What's, what's my end goal? I'm trying, I, I try to help. I'm trying to help people. I'm trying to help people not make the same mistakes I did. You know, that's generally the, you know, this, this, we might have cut, you know, we might have um, fell upon some wisdom and then we're really to add some knowledge and we're trying to like imbue that and put that out there. And again, to a point, make money from it. It's like in this weird area of like, okay, who am I to say this? But I know this, this is what I know. And I think within that, the, the best thing you can do for people is to show that, you know, this is just me and a human having a human experience with this all. And this is this is what I kind of know now. Who knows what's yeah. going to happen in the future? And that just lets people, yeah, just settle into that a little bit better. I think. Yeah, and make choices for themselves, right? Because like, mm -hmm. I definitely see that as like part of my job as a yoga teacher or like any kind of teacher, any kind of like guide. Like, it still makes me giggle thinking that I'm a teacher of something because I never intended that to be the case. And uh, you know. It's a funny sort of term being someone's teacher but it's like just leaving people a lot of space to make their own choices about what suits them and what serves them um, in the same way that I want to leave myself a lot of space to choose what suits me and serves me on a day-to-day -day basis you know and I think when I was a teenager and in my early 20s like I got into some real like sticky situations with myself of just trying to perfect everything and trying to find like the perfect formula and was really hard on my body and just really hard on myself generally for like you know not being able to find like this perfection and then learning that it just totally doesn't exist and it's not meant to exist and that we're not meant to find stability uh, or like permanence in anything because that's just not life right like there's no permanence and there's no stability <laughs> and we can create little structures that give us a sense of stability like our daily routines or like our identities on a bigger scale um you know and our relationships and our hobbies and our jobs but it's like they change all the time and they're going to change sometimes whether we like it or not so we might might as well kind of acknowledge and accept that that's the case and then enjoy that if we can enjoy that ability and that flexibility to change and the flexibility that we have in it, that's quite nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you think's taught you that more than anything? Like the, the impermanence of, of things? Um, I think in, on a sort of theoretical level, yoga, like a lot of the philosophies of yoga and the, the structures there. And then on a sort of personal level, like on a day to day level, working with my own body and my own voice in those practices, just realizing how much things shift over time and also how much things will shift day to day. And I think for me, that's why I love having those practices of yoga and singing and voice stuff, because it gives me something to kind of monitor, but or just to like observe you know that lovely word that we love to overuse <laughs> but the kind of just yeah just it gives me something to be like oh this changes all the time and it's just like at this reflective thing like reflects the rest of life and then of course like the pandemic was a huge one um my job you know like I've always been freelance I've always been like had that sort of up and down in my work of like things are never stable and steady and that can be hard sometimes like I like to be in control <laughs> and so it's like acknowledging that and accepting that and that's been a massive lesson of just go with the flow just like you know one month it's like this the next month it's like this it's just acknowledging that and and sitting back and then there are always those things that like floor you like family illness or you know just 
friendships and relationships, that things that shift that you don't expect ever. And it's so humbling, I think, when those things happen because you just think, oh, I've got that, at least I've got that bit under control. <laughs> and then something comes along that's like, boom, <laughs> actually, no. Um, so, yeah, it's lessons, isn't it? And I think freedom, so, if yeah. you want to say that way. Self-employment, is, yeah, for me, I can resonate for about five yeah. years and there's nothing that makes you more in tune with the weather or the seasons <laughs> or the... Or, or, or just general life, the, the, the ebbs yeah. and flows of how you're feeling. You can't really show up as well when you're doing it for yourself. You're not no one to be accountable to but you. So it's like, yeah. but I'm not feeling good. So. <laughs> yeah, totally. so, yeah, there's like that that interesting ground where you just kind of, yeah, like winter's a very different um, thing now. I work for myself, take a lot more time out and just surrender a lot more to the kind of rhythm of uh how things are going yeah do you that's smart i i get to winter every year and i'm like why can't i do this <laughs> like mm. it is harder and yeah i know what you mean and also you, you can't just sort of show up and do your bare minimum and somebody's paying you anyway you know like it's it, it can be tricky in that sense and i think there is a pressure to always kind of show up as your best self and like whatever that means um mm-hmm. because that's you know your your kind of next career move might be riding on that or like yeah yeah you know your next sort of recommendation and i think that's something i've had to learn to trust in as well just that like if i'm showing up i'm there for a reason and it's just just trust just trust that like whatever comes out whatever happens in that moment regardless of how i'm feeling even if i'm not feeling my best or feel like i can deliver my best like it's just meant to happen that way um and you know i think maybe that's a naive trust but i don't mind because <laughs> it keeps me sane and a lot of these little like ideas and structures that we keep of like it's meant to be and we're in the right place like what's the point in not having them do you know what i mean yeah i think the power of belief is is one underrated thing like yeah. even if there's some part of you that it's just trusting in that belief, right? It's still a belief. I can still say it and like make it, bring it into reality, like believing into uh, a way of, of like how it's meant to be. I think it's yeah. absolutely beautiful to just be honest and say, well, ultimately I don't know, but you know, this is this is what I choose to believe. This is happening for a reason. And yeah. I'll just take the little lessons from that. Like taking lessons from everything is also another way of like, just, just yeah getting closer to that belief of like, well, what is the lesson? How can I, how can I leverage this to, you know, shape me even better? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And like, yeah, it's like, you know, I know there's there's a sort of cynicism around a lot of the sort of positive thinking methods. And and I do, I do sometimes get a bit like, with some of the sort of toxic extreme positivity Mm -hmm. and there's a place for it um but I just I'm just like why not if it makes me a happier person and that makes me a nicer person to be around and it makes me more able to serve to do my work to enjoy my life for you to enjoy your life why why would we question those things so hard all the time you know I've given there's definitely spaces where yeah you know a a, the, like sort of positive mental attitude all the time that kind of like just replace your thoughts <laughs> like I'm like well <laughs> let's also explore you know the the sort of negative spiral a little bit if we need to and sort of see where that's coming from but if it's a day-to-day thing like yeah the silver linings if you can find them and it's not you're not burying trauma in doing that then I think like what's the exactly yeah. yeah 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 in just bypassing the kind of negative feelings with positive feelings yeah and try, trying to like not listen to what those negative feelings are rather yeah, than... it, it, yeah it's that's the thing right it depends it totally depends like if there are big feelings that need to be addressed there then maybe don't bypass them every single day <laughs> but like mm. if it's a moment of just like yeah if it's a moment of finding that sort of that lesson or whatever it is like oh what's the lesson in that 
it's, I think my, my opinion on that has changed as well in the last few years. I definitely used to be a bit more like, I'll just find a silver lining every single time. And like mm-hmm. friends would be like, you can find a silver lining in bin bag. Like, <laughs> you know, and you don't need to. And I think that was a real learning for me, like that sometimes you don't need to. And actually when it, mm. especially when it comes to moments where you might be getting hurt or taken, you know, taken for a ride, actually being able to step into that and being like, mm, actually no that goes beyond my boundaries and it doesn't align with my values um but that's not kind of just being a debbie downer or being a fun sponge you know it's just like it's actually like engaging with your your values and and where you're meeting those yeah exactly knowing yourself essentially isn't it like knowing where your boundaries are and your, your edges are and when you yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it's completely like all what we're talking about here is generally around balance of like when to engage the skeptic, when to engage the you know the, the positive belief, and it's when to yeah. kind of bring in these bring in these energies. Um, so, what would you say to you know uh, say there's a moment away you're like no, I'm just gonna when is kind of feeling too much kind of too much because I have this interesting space where it's like, I'm not going to like suppress feelings. I'm not going to be like toxically positive about something, you know, feelings and emotions. They're not facts. You, you might feel something it might not be justified, et cetera. But when, when to come out of that is a, quite an interesting one. When to like, you know, change um, something rather than just wait for it to change, you know, mm-hmm. like sitting into an emotion that's perhaps, um, not not exactly trying to say positive negative but something that's quite overwhelming when to just let that pass rather than you know actively do something about it I guess yeah um actually it's really funny you've just said something that I've literally got written on my t-shirt go on (laughs) it says facts are not feelings and feelings are not facts that's oh there you go that's literally like we placed that so (laughs) am I reading you (laughs) And on the back it's got I'm not falling for that shit again. That was what I was gonna say <laughs> next. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Um so um what was I gonna say? Oh I'm yeah. not falling for that shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. That is that is well, they're facts to you, but you know, ultimately yeah. they might not be the truth. No, totally. That's it. Like your friend might walk across the road and you'd be like, hey okay and they might thank you but they might not see you but you've internalized that and then the feeling is oh they don't like me oh what's going on but they've just not seen you but you're having a feeling which isn't based on facts that's more yeah and i think well i think that's the thing isn't it and like with feelings well it's just that practice of sitting with them isn't it and feeling what you're feeling what you're feeling Mm. instead of just reacting to what you're feeling it's responding to what you're feeling um and that gets easier, doesn't it? Like the more we practice and depending on how much sleep we've had, <laughs> it's quite definitely fine. And food, yeah. Yeah, and food. Yeah, you're one of those for sure. <laughs> I know that feeling. Um, yeah, and um, like my rule is always like, in the first instance, I will give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Like in, in that sort of initial like moment, I don't think I'm quick to feel um, not quick to feel like it's someone else's fault, not quick to blame. Sometimes take things too personally, I think, and get in my own way with that. But that's more that that's kind of the other side of the coin, isn't it? It's like taking responsibility where you don't need to. Do you know what I mean? Where you can actually just kind of let out go, whatever that means. Mm. <laughs> Like, oh, you know what I mean? Because then that's I guess letting it go is you taking responsibility as well. It is, isn't it? But just, yeah, mm. in a different kind. It's not taking the load and kind of holding on to yeah. it. Um, and maybe that's the same thing. I'm like, I'm confusing myself now. Because maybe taking offence is blaming the other person, you know, because you're kind of, mm, you're sort of thinking, oh, they, they created this scenario for me to feel hurt. I feel hurt. I take this personally. I don't know. <laughs> Get back to me on that. <laughs> <laughs> what does the T-shirt say? <laughs> what does the T-shirt say? <laughs> well, I think, well, yeah, it's, I think it's funny, isn't it? I used to, I think I used to have quite a sort of victim mindset, if that's a cliche, but like just that sense of 
well, everyone must hate me, <laughs> you know, or just like, mm. well, I must be doing things wrong. And I think as I've got older and just actually doing quite a bit of like looking at that and shifting that around to be like, A, everyone's way too busy thinking that everyone else hates them to, to hate mm. me. So, you know, just let everyone get on with their own space and then just being okay with myself and knowing that, like, again, like knowing my values, knowing my boundaries and being like, well, I don't need to match up with theirs. Um, and I think that makes the whole kind of process of, of just feeling a, a lot simpler because you can kind of be like, well, I'm feeling this thing, where is that in my body? Like, I feel that in my body. And by the time you kind of done that, it dissipates, right? It just kind of, you're like, this is in me. This isn't like in the air around us. This isn't like a catching thing that they've thrown at me. <laughs> this is like, this is in me and I'm allowed to feel that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's like, yeah, it, it's a, it's a fact that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what kind of brought you into this, what you say you've always been freelance is yeah. that since is that since university or since yeah yes yeah, so, university. So, I, mean, I guess oh the dogs are gonna bark so someone at the door you're ready for this so good it's voice activation we're <laughs> allowing it okay it's just gone quiet i think my dad's quiet and moved on um yeah i so well i guess i started singing when i was a teenager so started mm -hmm. doing gigs and stuff when you've always been a singer yeah from when i was about 11. wow I started um, sort of performances. I just loved it. I really loved it. And I think I did first bits and pieces at school and my parents were like, she likes this. And I think I kind of got me some lessons and went from there. Um, yeah, and so then I was doing gigs and things in my late teens. And then, yeah, I mean, I, like I had like little cafe jobs and bar jobs and that kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. and in my in uni. but. I came straight out of uni and did a random bunch of stuff, um, just little freelance gigs, like did some copywriting, did some like magazine review stuff. Um, I love writing. And then, yeah, went to California to do my yoga teacher training. Just wanted to get away from the UK and go somewhere on my own and do that. But I really had no intention to be a yoga teacher, I really, really, didn't I just I didn't really know what I wanted to do I wanted to pursue music but felt like I didn't know where to go with that I think I was pretty afraid of what that looked like and of kind of putting myself out that or out there to to do that and I think it's so lucky that I didn't dive headfirst into music and I did end up going on the kind of yoga route because I think like my self-confidence and my self assuredness and my self-knowledge would have taken me to some pretty great grimy places if I'd gone into music and as it was, yoga taught me everything I needed to know in that really kind of, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a kind of, it mm. just happened. Yeah, it just happened that I sort of, like, I just met a lot of people who just gave me this sense of like, oh, life can be really different. And all these people on my teacher training were doing really diverse things and living their lives in ways that I hadn't seen as much of growing up, you know, and um, that just kind of, broadened my horizons and yeah I, I came back moved to London and again I was gonna go and study music and then I didn't I put it off a year and in that year I was like working part-time in a shop and teaching yoga and it just escalated and I just got asked to do more teaching stuff I did more little side gig stuff like working for different projects with copywriting and producing things and such a mixture and it was an amazing time it was a really hard time in so many ways because i was just like finding my feet in this big city and r dealing with a lot of self-confidence stuff and a lot of old like eating disorder stuff from my late teens and then but it all kind of came together and it enabled me to yeah find my own rhythm in my teaching and and again re-establish my values and yeah that it's kind of continued and things kind of continue to branch in different ways and the same with the singing teaching like somebody somebody asked me to start singing teaching and I did and then word of mouth it just kind of grew into something bigger um, and I loved it so I just kept doing it <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like you've you've learned along the the yoga path to hold space. Mm. That coupled with your passion for music and singing and voice has yeah. like crafted this. I don't know many voice activation coaches or, or even voice coaches for that matter. Of course they exist, but like, you know, that that combination of like, because yoga really it it does it when you hold space in that capacity it's it's like it's it's very it's a safe space people really need to feel that don't they in a in a classroom yeah you know to be able to just express and just allow things to just unfold as they do and it's all about that it's all very much about you know and i'm sure you could talk about just yeah, allowing you to just be where you are right now um which cultivates to say space but then they need to really feel that from you and i guess that when you teach people the voice stuff it works kind of so well oh i'm glad you think so i mean it's funny you know this stuff like this sort of whole term of like voice activation that was something that tony came up with like, and he was just like <laughs> that's what you're doing i was like okay <laughs> you know but i guess it's you sort of sometimes you Sometimes it takes other people to show you what you're worth, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. You have your own baggage to words and uh, what, when you're so close to something, it's hard to see it from another point of view. Yeah, um, it's yeah. so true. And I think one of the things, you know, I've, I've been teaching yoga for, or like teaching yoga in London for nearly eight years. And it's like, you see so much stuff that I'm kind of going to try and avoid the word, the word bullshit, but like just ungrounded you know, mm -hmm. like, and I really don't, I don't want to rain on anyone's parade because I, I, I love to think that everyone is doing their best. But sometimes you do come across people who you're just like, you're not doing your best. <laughs> you know, <And> you're, just <laughs> like, you're actually just trying to take a lot of people's money. <laughs> and you just, I, I think that has made me unnecessarily afraid because I, you know, each to their own and maybe they have their people and they have their space and what they do is definitely worth it regardless of you know what they want out of it everybody has their has their thing everybody has their path but there's been a, quite a few things that have scared me away from making too many claims like I really always want to offer something that is of substance and that is authentic and real and and that feels like just I guess grounded um, and human uh, but also really helpful um, and I do some, maybe maybe I think that's it's easy to stop ourselves isn't it and to, to be like well I can't be that person that offers that mm. um, when we really need to just trust that other people are inviting us into that space and be like well okay I'm just gonna show up and do my best and yeah I think that's all that's all we can kind of ask us of, of ourselves as it's all yeah. we can ask of others like who are you to say that they don't need what you have you know yeah like who are you to tell them that i guess it's not for them like let the people decide i guess yeah like, yeah and that whole thing of like you're never really ready right mm -hmm. like i don't think i'll ever be like i've got the perfect package you know it's just gonna it, things evolve as you're working on them and then definitely learn that through yoga teaching and through voice stuff you know it's just like when the first when I taught my first yoga class, I didn't feel ready. When the first person asked me to teach singing, thing is, how are you going to know? Because you've never done it before. I, it really confuses me that it's like exactly. It, yeah, I haven't, I haven't done it. I'll know when I'm doing it, and if it doesn't feel right, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and generally, like, I don't know. Have you ever had an experience where you come away from offering something or doing something that you know you were invited to do, and you've come away and gone, oh, that was terrible. I really shouldn't have been there. Like, it doesn't happen that really, much, yeah. does it? No, like, so we step up to it. And I think that's sometimes like a huge part of finding what it is. Like we, we, we just keep stepping up to it. And that's the growth, isn't it as well? Like, yeah, like, I guess so. that's what people mean when they say fake it till you make it in a way, because it always confused me that but I've come back and forth with, I don't know, there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. It's not about faking something, but it's it's you you're just kind of doing something over again to get good at it, kind of thing. Yeah. As long as you're being authentic with what it is you're presenting and not not lying about it, not you know trying to be someone you're not. Uh, yeah. There's a lot in there. That there is a lot in there, isn't there? Because there is there is a sort of 
you know, why can't we be somebody that we're not if we're trying to be that somebody that we're not? Mm. There's a process there, but then it's it's different, isn't it? To you know, I do believe in kind of stepping into being the person that you want to be. Sometimes that can really just help you get past that barrier of showing up. Of like, it can just yeah, it can get you there in many many areas of life. You know, like not just in your professional life, but in just sort of practice, just practice being the person that you want to be and see how it feels, like experience that in, in any way you can. But then there is that fine line between just lying, <laughs> just mm-hmm. not delivering substance. And mm-hmm. um, but like you yeah. say, it, it's... I guess that's why it's important for as adults to teach younger generations how to kind of feel people you know feel energy from people and like that's the key because if you feel something's not right maybe you're internalizing it or maybe you're thinking it's you or really you're picking up energy from someone else um and in turn they will feel you feeling that and it's a reflection but that's the only thing that is really gonna i guess help you just figure out life and where to go and who to not go to for something it's the, the yoga world is so fascinating because it stands kind of alone in its unregulation of mm-hmm. the whole. And I'm sure, you, you know, you've, um, you know, kind of dived into what all that means, I guess. And like, yeah, it, who's in the yoga world? It's like no one really says, right, you're ready because this is what we've taught. And because it's, it's so gen- it's, it's so like relative to, to to everyone. It's so different for everyone and it's changing so much. I mean, you know, we could have hours of a conversation of what is yoga and what it really means but it is so personal to people now um Mm -hmm. but i i think ultimately that's a good thing because you're letting people decide like who teaches you what and of course because you're dealing with people's physical bodies there's an element there of like right there needs to be some you know kind of regulation but does there like (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i mean yes but have we gone too far that way you know and and and, and mm-hmm. this kind of uh, industry, I guess, is, is kind of bringing it back to something a bit more fluid um, and not structured in masculine in that way. Yeah, totally. And I think as long as it's delivered in that way and there's this sense of choice and the sense of like exploring things rather than it being like, this is the way, you know, I think like, in a mm-hmm. maybe it was my schooling or whatever it was I felt like there had to be one way you know and it was like a bit more like there's a right there's a wrong and Mm. especially with physical stuff um I think when I first started teaching yoga there were were a lot more like held beliefs that were really stuck of like this is how you do this pose this is how you do this and this is yoga and this is not and there's definitely still a lot of that conversation going on um and some of it I really agree with, you know, it's like actually maybe some of these classes we should be calling a stretching class and that's great. But if we're not using the yoga philosophy, like is it cultural appropriation to like prescribe that to yoga? So it's, it's, it's like you say, we could have a, like hours and hours of conversation mm. on this. But um, ultimately, yeah, I think if people have choice and they're aware of choice and then, it, yeah, it does, it comes back to that thing, isn't it? Of feeling it out, trying it out, keeping that openness and knowing what, knowing yourself, like knowing what you need, knowing what your values are. Because I think in, like you said, you know, there are maybe, there there are regulations in yoga around how people work with people's bodies. And I know on all of my trainings, I've had anatomy training. But the tricky thing that's happening in the yoga world is that there's a lot of psychology, sort of like pop psychology. So it's, you know, one-liners that are kind of taken out of context. And it crosses over with the the toxic positivity stuff as well. Um, And yoga teachers are acting like they're psychotherapists or that they're, you know, trained in other areas that perhaps they need a bit more training in. And because when you're working with people's bodies, like you could injure them. When you're working with people's minds, like, that's long-term damage that you don't want to do, you know? You don't want to, like, fuck with people's brains. <laughs> so, but as a teacher, like, you 
have that space you totally do you know mm. you get someone in a shavasana you can whisper anything in their ear and they're yours <laughs> like, <laughs> so and it's no wonder is it that like these cults and these strange like osho and bikram they come out of these sort of mm -hmm. yogic practices and then surprise surprise they're actually a huge pervert and they're you know subjecting everybody to awful things it, it people are in a vulnerable in a vulnerable space and it's that same space of openness and vulnerability that can lead to a lot of enjoyment and a lot of freedom and a lot of choice, but it can also lead to a lot of manipulation um, and like restriction as well. So that I think really needs regulating, like it really does. And I know a lot of brilliant yoga teachers who take a lot of care over that. But I've also seen and heard of quite a few that aren't, you know, we all, we've all heard those stories. And you just hope that the people who are in the classes are not at their most vulnerable. But lots of people are when they come to yoga. Lots of people are seeking something and they need support. Um, but I don't know what the answer is to that. Because who's mm -hmm. to say that any regulation around any of these kind of therapies and practices, what's right and what's wrong. That's such a, a tricky, Actually, tricky yeah. thing, isn't it? There's a lot of other views that, that come up with that. And I suppose enter the online world and then you add another layer to all this. <laughs> nuts, isn't it? It's nuts. I found myself scrolling through something yesterday and I was just like, Poof. you know, when you go down one of those rabbit holes where you just end up on somebody in Midwest America doing something crazy to make money and you just think, wow, <laughs> like I worry about my choices. <laughs> And like, I'm playing things pretty safe. Like there are so many ways to live life, you know? It's, it's yeah. baffling, it's brilliant, it's, it's nuts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's on that though, you, you do, because you have to check in with like, oh God, I'm being very harsh on myself because yeah. you're, you're trying to like walk that line and really check in with like, what am I going too far over this direction or this direction? And then, yeah, you pop up someone on Instagram and you're just like, wow, okay. <laughs> and they've just got millions of views. Wow, yeah. this is interesting. And probably millions of pounds from some sponsor. And like, you know, you're just like, oh. Yeah. How many brains is that like, you know, penetrated? Uh, <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Crazy. And like, yeah, I'm just sitting here worrying about the distribution of wealth and whether I should put out that newsletter. You know, it's just like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> contemplating a post. <laughs> <laughs> and that is definitely something I'm, I'm trying to like get over myself a bit more you know mm -hmm. um yeah it's tricky though it was going like when you think of everything else we've just spoken about like how you want to put out things that are authentic and um I mean authentic's a really varied one isn't it because authentic to who but you want to put out something that feels like it's a substance I guess that's what you always come back to it's like we can't attach too much to anything because there are so many ways to live life and there are so many different values that you can have. And it's a tricky one when you see that somebody's values are so opposite to your own, mm. particularly when they're running your country. But like, you know what I mean? It's just, it's such a, it's how do we be okay with that? But, yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's more than values because I guess values change over time, but then like morals mm. and uh, virtues is, something that's so fascinating because it's they're the things that are guiding everything really someone's morals what's it moral to do and what's not and it yeah it can vary so much mm. person to person yeah um mm -hmm. yes, I'd, i want to touch upon the the voice stuff because i think it's i'd love to give people like a flavor of um a workshop or or something because obviously last time we were together i was talking to a tree i didn't actually <laughs> Tell you what happened i was actually had an argument with the tree really? um, using new language as yeah. you uh as you guided us to do and uh yeah it was it was interesting so this was my experience and then we can get people's ears and then you can talk all about the fun of voice stuff um <laughs> and why and why it is so potent and i'd also like to tap into any kind of workshops that you've done where What's the most unexpected thing that's happened um, within a workshop? Because I just think that the, the playing field is so large. Like people can go 
in so many directions because you allow for that and you allow that space to just I'd love to know if there's anything that you just never expected to happen happen um but my experience with the tree so I went off to find a tree and to communicate with it with language that I've never you know, heard of or using my voice in a, in a very different way and uh I was kind of sizing trees up using some sort of like vocal I was I was trying to communicate how high each tree was using my voice, um, which was really interesting to get my head around how I was even doing that, if it was even possible. Um, but I was just playing with it. And then I think I got what I needed, this kind of moment of just like an outburst of energy. Um, I got like a dr droplet, whether it was sap, I don't think so. I think it was water from a leaf. Dropped to my eye, which I interpreted as the tree was spitting on me. And then I ended, I ended up pushing the tree. No, nothing too crazy. Uh, and then getting into this really like quite intense argument with it. Um, for about five minutes. And then just, just casually walked away like nothing had happened. That's <laughs> that was the experience. But I think we, I got what, what, what I needed in that moment. Yeah? You feel like you did? Yeah. Well, that's that's all that matters, really, isn't it? Because exactly. you, you you totally led that that experience. That's so interesting. Mm. So, well, okay, I'm really interested to, to to know if you care to share why you feel like you got what you needed in that moment. Like, what does that mean? Mm. I think I explored something which I didn't intend on doing, which was great because it just get allowed me to just accept what came out. So that that was kind of one thing um and not judge it or not like think too much about it just kind of let and see what was because who am i to say what my body needs like my body is so much more intelligent than me so <laughs> getting my head out of the way and like get the stories and the ideas of what something is this workshop is meant to be get that remove that and just like just lead with some some kind of intuition i guess so mm -hmm. that was why i thought i got what i needed because yeah i felt like i was removed from it and it was what was coming out was just coming out mm. and it mm. just i just allowed it and then just yeah moved on to the next part of the day <laughs> see that's that's cool because i mean you're someone who has a lot of like awareness of yourself and your processes there so you're able mm. to kind of explain to me what you felt and what that was and regardless of whether you can or not like something happened and it, you were able to express yourself in some way right and i think the reason i take the words out of that exercise mm -hmm. is because words we like we know like language has so many connotations and we'll start using words and it's easy to get into like corners and ruts and phrases that we use all the time and basically ways of expressing ourselves that we use all the time yeah we can hide behind them can't we yeah and like yeah. We, and we learn them from other people so it's like sometimes it can be tricky to to know whether that's a phrase we've taken on or if that's really like how we want to say mm. what we're trying to say or express what we're trying to express yeah what's coming up for me now is is something so powerful because I more so younger younger years I, I would I'd have go-to comments or go-to jokes or, or not even jokes it's like things that would happen and I'd it wouldn't even be what I want to say but I know it's gonna make people laugh or like I have these phrases that I'll just use in a moment and it's it's kind of like I'll hide behind that or I'll use it in a moment of silence so it'll kind of be escape from feeling what is present you know yeah yeah mm. that's yeah that's that's it isn't it and in some ways like we'll do that a bit every day anyway because we talk a lot and we we communicate you know in some days we have to communicate a lot and if it's it's it, the brain is inevitably going to have pathways and passageways of like phrases and speech that comes easier than other bits so it's faster it's more efficient to use those phrases that we're used to using but like you say like we can hide behind them and not just from other people but from ourselves because we just get used to using these words that'll do <laughs> you know and so we take the words out to explore making sound 
that reflects the sensations that we're feeling, right? And that, it's really funny trying to explain this through words. I always find this because, you know, you're, I'm inevitably doing what exactly what I'm just saying. <laughs> like certain phrases want to come out and I'm like, stay there. <laughs> um, it's, it, 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 it gives us this sort of two point thing of A, it makes us stop and go, okay, what am I actually feeling then? Like if I were to take away the phrases that I know, I can't express this with words. So what am I feeling? And then I think there's this just beautiful power in making things a noise and a sound because it's putting it out into the world. Um, it's easy to write things down. I think it's easier to write things down. I think it's probably easiest just to think them. And then it's like the next stage is maybe like writing things down. But saying it out loud is a different process. And I think whether or not that's with another person and to another person, just making sound in the world is a really interesting process. Um, I say interesting because it's really complicated and there's a lot more there than I understand or I'm an, any expert of, but it's just from my experience, from my own personal experience of making sound in loads of different scenarios as a kind of performing singer and just for myself and in communication and as a space holder, if you like, there are just many ways in which it makes us connect with ourselves um, on, on a kind of deeper level. Um, and then finding those particular sounds that express what we're trying to express. I think there's a beautiful connection between feeling those vibrations and feeling that like production of sound, feeling the, the, the muscles in our body, the air that we take in and, and using those to form an expression that we maybe haven't used before. Um, hence the find a different language or find sounds that aren't words that you know already. Um, it's just a, it's just a practice of self-discovery and also slightly sort of meditative because you have to go through that process of finding what you're really feeling but it's also ridiculous and that's what I love about it because it undercuts that whole taking yourself seriously thing which can get so far in the way of people just expressing themselves because we think like oh I can't put that out in the world you know like it's just, you know, what does that say about me? And it's this thing of we get stuck in our identities and we get stuck in that sense of having everything to be really serious. And so if we're talking complete, like, gobbledygook to a tree, it's like, well, this is ridiculous, so I might as well. Um, so that's the kind of thinking behind it. And mm. it came quite organically, actually, on a, on a workshop. And this goes all the way back to what we were saying. Sometimes you have to just be in a situation for things to happen and things to evolve, right? And I was in a group, a smaller group of retreat people. And I just noticed things were getting a bit heavy in the room. And it was a particularly like emotional day for a lot of people who were on a retreat. It was that sort of middle of the retreat week that people, you know, stuff starting to come up as people relax and get into their practices. And, and it was stopping people making noise and it was stopping people um, kind of exploring a new story, if you like. I think people were getting caught up in their stories about what they were feeling. Um, we'd been doing quite a bit of journaling and a lot of yoga and a lot of kind of deep chats. And I just sort of suddenly was like, right, everyone turn to face the trees. <laughs> and instead of talking to each other, we're just gonna talk to the trees. And then it was like, okay, how can I get rid of this barrier of people being aware that the person next to them might hear them? It's like, okay, well, we're gonna not use the English language or any language you know, you know? And it's just like working with kids when it's like that. It's just like, you yeah. can see what people are thinking and you can see them kind of start to shut down. And you're like, right, okay, how do we just make this ridiculous and free it up? Um, so that's kind of where that came from. Um, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> it's beautiful how that evolved. Mm. They can just picture it like people just being very aware of, of the neighbour or perhaps trying to not letting themselves completely go. Yeah. And uh, mm, what do you kind of notice in, in the in the in the workshops? Do you notice people 
are holding a lot back and what what makes them what allows them to let go and just be a bit more present or, or not care as much of how they sound yeah that's really interesting because i think we have these ways that we have settled into of what it means to make sound right and it's either performative and kind of like you were saying before you had certain phrases that you knew would make people laugh and it's interesting to see like you can get a group of adults that start behaving a little like kids and they're kind of like you know like trying to impress each other <laughs> mm. and it's really cute because you see this kind of inner child thing working where everyone yeah, oh, you just want to be loved yeah exactly right you just want everyone here to like you and also and then that thing that is an interesting thing and i wonder whether it's i mean it's it's age old but it's also probably got a bit to do with like our presence online and our kind of this way that we have lives now that are way more visible in in terms what i mean by that is like you know loads more people if we're online loads more people can see what we're saying and what we're writing and what we're doing so we feel a lot more visible and that either goes one way in that we feel a lot more kind of confident in that but we can also feel a lot more like oh god i've got to show up for something in particular and our words have more worth in a sense they have more weight and i think it's interesting to see as people get older and like working with kids they will say whatever they want but you work with adults and they're aware of what their words mean and what the judgments are from around and what you know so there's a bit more kind of care and whether that's kind of performative or just a bit repressed and a bit like I'm just going to be really careful with my words um so I think I try to start or try to incorporate practices in a workshop depending on the energies I kind of do things in different different points but something that enables people to make it a bit more of a meditative practice and we kind of take a moment to come inside and be like okay what am I feeling so it's not all about expressing so then it's not all performative um and to try and get people to see that it's not about how you're being heard but it's about what you're expressing do you know what i mean so it's more for ourselves in so many ways but it's, it's only for others in that we empower others to make sound when we make sound we're not performing and we're not trying to communicate anything in particular unless we really want to but then that comes from that space of having checked in first with what that really is that we want to express yeah yeah i think you speak to that really well um in the, in, in your workshop i think i was at one of the move breathe chills where you just sat at the front and just story told and and did some voice stuff and it was very much like like that initially was like who's who's this <laughs> and and how are you able to just talk to the audience as if you're just like one of us but then like hold that space in such a an amazing way whilst everyone goes into the ice it was like i was like what is happening here but it's like so <laughs> genuine and like and uh it, that that was phenomenal but yeah uh, and then obviously your workshop at the 100 human um it just it felt like yeah you were always trying to guide us back to like the place it's coming from you know like whether it's the air within us and just paying attention to where that air sits or how to how to kind of nurture that it was always like you yeah you the focus really is trying to tune into that space which essentially is just tuning into self and helped you to get more in tune with yourself yeah. um so yeah yeah it, it it's uh it just felt like there's so much potential there just to for it to help people really yeah. get more more in tune with themselves i hope so <laughs> <laughs> I think it, does, it does take a while as well and i think you know mm. the workshop thing is really interesting because i think I often get to the end of it and I'm like, ah, oh, if I only had like another four days, you know, or like, or a lifetime with someone, or just, I notice this with one-to-one -one clients, students, like it's sometimes take, it takes a year for someone to tap into that space of like, I know what I'm trying to say now um, mm. and not worrying about what do I sound like? Um, that's interesting, isn't it? Like, 
it, I guess it's it's an inevitable thing because our communication has weight sometimes or it has leverage and it you know we communicate with each other through sound um so it's it's a switch to make um but some people are have had experience that make them experiences that make them afraid to express themselves whether that's through song or through just speaking um or you know it can be developmental things that happen when they're really young um it's just or just experiences where somebody's told them to shut up and someone's or told them that they have no right to speak and in some mm. in one way or another um or they've been listened to too much that's really interesting when people are really used to being listened to so maybe they're you know they're performers or they are they do a lot of public speaking in their work and they're used to everybody being very attentive to what they say so they feel they have to create a certain experience or provide a certain thing um it's really really mm-hmm. interesting to to see how that evolves um and to kind of shift that to a more like internal dialogue first if you know what i mean mm-hmm. yeah it's kind of dark side of of that um i'd say i think everyone has had an experience of that and not thought much of it but it's like oh okay now i know i'm not a singer or like you've you've you know you've been told who sings that okay let them sing it then or like there's yeah. some sort of joke there or, or, or you're just sad. expressing because most most children will at some point like press with their voice they'll sing along to a song and and at what point does that not happen yeah. so if a human was happy singing and whistling is like so such a genuine expression and a way of way of being yeah. not for everyone but i definitely think people are less judgmental on themselves or didn't fear the judgment from others then uh you'd let yourself sing a lot more you'd let yourself hum yeah. in moments i wish i wish we would like it'd be kind of mad but it'd be a beautiful world if everyone was just going around singing and humming it's also because it's really good for us as well and it's like it's a mm. natural antidepressant it like releases all the like bonding hormones just to sing mm. so imagine that is a world i want to live in <laughs> just want to get everyone making sound like if everybody started the day just belting out a couple of tunes the world would be such a happier place like a much happier place it's yeah but it's interesting isn't it that we've it's become a space that people only do like dancing actually yeah it's very like, similar you know, about, about that yeah it's that thing of like it's only only with certain substances involved or only certain scenarios and then it's it's still a bit like almost tongue-in-cheek or a bit it's not like a regular thing um it's it's a western thing though i think there are lots of other cultures where singing is part and parcel and it's interesting like i didn't have a religious upbringing but you know religion brings a lot of like singing and chanting in and Mm -hmm. I know that you know a lot of people don't have that kind of system of faith anymore where they would go to a community space and sing together um but it's probably one of the only things like going to chapel at school or like you know things like that like that would get me singing with my mates but mm-hmm. other than that or we were on a dance floor at a party you know um yeah bring back these spaces is our mission yeah yeah, I feel like we've yeah. thrown a lot out <laughs> with religion, haven't we? We've thrown a lot out with that baby with the bath water type thing because there's, there's, you know, there's stood the test of time, those things that really help people through yeah. whether it's dark times or just, just general day-to-day, like somewhere, um, what is the church, you know, asking yourself, like, where is your church? Where do you go now to seek commune, to seek counsel, to to sing as people or just to 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 meet and share air in terms of like breathe together like when you breathing together yoga we breathe together um that's a space that you could perhaps um relate that to but yeah Mm -hmm. humming the the more i like learn more about these certain things and along along the the path i just always go back to oh that's exactly what's happening in you know meditation or 
when you when I traveled Southeast Asia and spent a lot of time in temples and I'm like, oh, that is actually what was happening. Like yeah. sitting for passengers. Oh, it was that was it was just a lot of humming and breathing together. Yeah. And that was what was doing the work. That was what was allowing people to, you know, achieve a state or just reassess their life by just humming and breathing together and just reset their nervous systems and yeah the rest of it totally. it's so simple isn't it when you think when you put it like that and you just think how did we get so far away from that when it's so simple like mm. <laughs> what went wrong <laughs> so, yeah yeah it does give a lot of space yeah mm -hmm. um what would you say to people who want to kind of learn more about how they can get more in tune with themselves through with their voice or is there any certain practices that you point people to or if they want to like kind of go away from class and, and work on their own kind of practice yeah I think just like well obviously there are techniques and things to using the voice safely and I mean we do those in sessions but you can also find bits and pieces online to to know that and I'd always say that as a foundation because I don't want people wrecking their voices <laughs> That's the kind of technical teacher <laughs> disclaimer, but um, just humming and making sound and getting used to hearing your own sound. I think even just like doing that for a few minutes every day will open up that whole process of just being like, I'm allowed to do this. I'm allowed to make sound and get past that kind of like who's listening and just normalize humming, whether it's just like humming along to a song or like, you know, that's if you, if you, somebody who doesn't really sing very much um but just wants to get used to that sense of making sound and what it can do for your body try just putting on a favorite song and humming along to it and it doesn't matter if you don't know it it doesn't matter if you're not if you know note perfect if you think you can't sing if you think you can't pitch notes it does not matter because just humming or using this uh, sort of an ah or an oh or an ooh along to something is gonna get those vibrations down the vagus nerve and get everything kind of toned and beautiful again start releasing those like oxytocin dopamine serotonin get you feeling really good and then that's like five minutes or that of that five to ten minutes but if you can do three minutes a day great it's just those long exhalations that you have to create when you're singing a phrase of a song um, that as well you're just down regulating the nervous system in so many ways um but interestingly yeah. if it's something that you find stressful a bit like yoga it's that whole combination of putting yourself in in scenarios that are slightly stressful and slightly outside of the comfort zone so you you know maybe re releasing a little bit of adrenaline a little bit of cortisol but then you're kind of countering that with a whole load of happy hormones i hate that phrase but <laughs> you know the kind of the relaxing ones the chilling you out ones and so you it's it's like an ice bath it's like all of those things that we do that are like a bit uncomfortable but we persevere you're training your system to be like it's all good it's all good it's all good um and uh, yeah it's all the same benefits you know just from humming mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's nuts how similar work is to, to intentionally humming a song yeah yeah and it can be just a little easier you can hum along to a tune when you're in the car one thing i have found i guess natural and it's just started to come out i mentioned this on another podcast uh every time i'm in the in the sea or in cold water i'll use that hum to just yeah release and then i just find tunes with it and, and let it just kind of go wherever it wants to but yeah that yeah. practice for me and just kind of it helps me relax but it also helps me concentrate on the out breath and i'm just humming for as long as i can and it's just so therapeutic even that. just to hear that mm. yeah yeah because it's also this thing of just like i'm alive <laughs> you know i'm making sound i can at least be with my own voice it gives you this sense of just being in your own company in a different way you know and i think also for people who find it hard to connect to the breath i know some people I found this in, in yoga and with singing stuff, they find it uncomfortable to monitor the breath and to be aware of the breath. Um, sound, in a, like, of course, uses the breath, but it's something different to monitor. 
and it can feel slightly external. It can feel slightly sort of separate from having to like monitor your body. Um, it's, but it is, it's doing all that good work and it is still connecting inwards. But it, you know what I mean? It's just that slight separation, which can make it more accessible. Um, mm -hmm. All right, your dog needs walking. Should wrap this up <laughs> um, before that sound him. comes out again. <laughs> uh, so, where can people find you? Uh, are you doing any online classes or anything, or next workshops? Uh, yes. So, teach online and in person in London. Um, Miss Kate Lister is all my stuff. So Instagram, website, all of that. And uh, workshops I've got coming up, doing some retreats over the summer. Mm -hmm. It'll all be on my website next week because I'm actually at the moment updating my website. <laughs> so if you could all visit that next week. <laughs> but it won't be out till, yeah, next week. <laughs> Great. I'm all trying to get That gives you two weeks. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. This has been so much fun. Appreciate so much. Fun. I hope there was some stents in there. I was going <laughs> to rip parts of my brain that was not visited for a while. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much. <laughs> not at all. Thank you, Chris. Such a pleasure. Thank you for watching all the way through. Really appreciate it. And I hope it was valuable for you. If it was, please. Let me know in the comments, maybe share something that resonated for you the most or ask me or okay, a question, anything we've covered or anything else. Interact with us in the comments and yes, I wish you a good day and just to let you know, I've also got a men's group. It's called the Being Human Community. This is all about using a shared space online and locally here in the Northeast to understand what it means to be a man to explore those edges, those discomforts, get more in tune with ourselves, how to live more presently and how to live a more connected and empowered life, what that really means. So if that sounds something you're interested in, are you looking for a group, are you looking for truth, growth, sustainable change, then please head over to bodymindpractice.co.uk forward slash being human also, I've got a YouTube channel called Body Mind Practice Yoga and Movement. Now, this is where I share all my yoga videos and you can find just two of them at the moment there, but I will be uploading more in the future. So please subscribe for updates. Thank you and I'll speak to you all soon. Bye-bye.